Awesome. Looks like we have a lot of folks joining so we can get started uh, to respect your schedules. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Um, and we appreciate you coming to the third and final um, uh, session of our community of learning series, the paths to vaccine equity. Um, today's focusing on mobile vaccine clinics. Uh, my name is Tiffany Stark. Uh, for those that um, do not know me yet, um, I'm one of the public health program managers here at Nakui. Um, and also joining me today is my colleague, Micah Granthrop. Uh, she's one of the public health project coordinators. Um, and Micah and I will be your host today. So we would like to thank you for volunteering your time and joining in today's discussion. Uh, we at Nakui appreciate your willingness to share your personal experiences with vaccines for COVID-19 and beyond. Um, and we do understand that this could be a sensitive topic. Um, so this is a safe place. Feel free to share as much as you feel comfortable sharing. And there are no right or wrong answers. Uh, so we know everyone's in a different place with capacity and vaccine progress. Uh, so this is a chance for us all to learn from one another. Next slide. Again, we're very pleased that you could join us today. Uh, so your answers are very important and will allow us to further understand uh, the needs around adult vaccinations, uh, specifically around COVID-19 and flu, and how Nakui can better assist with any barriers or roadblocks as well. Uh, if you have any IT difficulty during today's call, please chat directly to comms and events and Carmen can further assist you. And finally, if you could, uh, please enter in your name, UIO, or external organization and any tribal affiliations into the chat box. That way we get to know each other and also count your attendance. And also just a quick note uh, before we begin, we would uh, like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Uh, so if you have video capability, please enable your camera. Uh, that way we have a more interactive environment. Um, and also note that the microphones are muted currently, uh, but you will have a chance to ask questions. You can raise your hand at the bottom uh, if you would like to be called on or just unmute if there's silence and pop in. And our chat box will be monitored as well. Uh, so please drop any questions or comments along the way and we'll address them at the designated time. And this will also be um, recorded to uh, further help with our educational and quality improvement purposes. And we would also like to provide the acknowledgement uh, for the project. So this is funded in part by a cooperative agreement with the CDC uh, for uh, CDC RFA IP 21-2107. And we'll provide a little uh, background on Nakui if we have any uh, new folks joining. Uh, so the National Council of Urban Indian Health, or Nakui as we like to say for short, is the national nonprofit organization devoted to the support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. And we also want to take note of our evaluation. Uh, this helps us to better support you and the needs that you um, have around vaccines. So we have the link and the QR code um, for you to access. So we definitely appreciate your feedback. And taking a look at our agenda. Uh, so we have two presentations today. Uh, and then we'll have an open floor for questions and comments. And then we'll conclude with some uh, resources and um, upcoming events. So now I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our first speaker, Shelly Solopow uh, from Denver Indian Health and Family Services. Uh, Shelly is Little Shell Chippewa, originally from Montana, but has lived in Colorado for over 20 years. Uh, she has worked with the Native community and positions in Indian education and behavioral health since 2005. She worked at Denver in Indian Health and Family Services from 2015 to 2018, managing the behavioral health department. For the last five years, Shelley has been the tribal liaison for the Colorado Behavioral Health Administration, 
And she's also been able to meet many people all over the state who work with Native Americans and help support behavioral health services overall. She has since returned to uh, Denver to help address the systemic barriers to healthcare and the effects this has on Native people. Uh, so at this time, I would like to pass the presentation over to Shelly and please enter in your favorite emoji in the chat box to welcome Shelly. Oh, what a good idea. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm, I'm open to any emoji <laughs> whatsoever. So just let her go. <laughs> I'm really happy to be with you all today. Um, so I guess I'll just jump in. And I just kind of want to let you know that uh, we do focus in this presentation on sort of like the underpinnings. However, I can an answer some like basic questions um, about uh, this particular topic. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to get started. So we're talking about addressing health inequities uh, with the mobile health service. And this is really the beginning here. Just I'll go quickly through the background and our plan um, to approach disparities. You could. Um, I'm not going to read everything because it's really detailed, but um, I just wanted to give a little bit of setting. A lot of you know about higher rates of chronic disease and uninsured um, uh, and underinsured in our in our state and probably in your states as well. Um, but there are also other barriers. There's distrust. There's historical trauma. Again, you probably are aware of that. Um, and still, uh, still we have migration from our uh, policy of relocation in those times. Um, we have had a lot of requests from the community saying, hey, you know, we live here, help us. You, you guys, uh, you're up in Denver, we can't, we can't get there. That's uh, important to know. And then um, of course, uh, I don't think it's really the same as any other state in the sense that really more than 90% of our eligible American Indian Alaska natives are really from outside the Southern Ute and Ute Mountain Ute areas and lands where they have their, um, you know, they also have, they struggle with their small health centers and whatnot and, and budgets. So, um, I, but I just kind of wanted to give you that picture of where all the people are. Um, and of course, uh, many of you know that urban clinics were affected by COVID quite a bit. And I think I think it made it on there that Really, as you know, before the pandemic, we were very underfunded and the pandemic actually helped loosen up funds um, to build the staff that we already needed, yet alone to meet that. So now that additional funds are sort of dwindling away, um, we're kind of back where we started, but we are trying to sustain. And we did sort of like double in size in the last three years. So it's it's been crazy around here. So, OK, next one. So uh, we were looking at this really social drivers of health, I like to call them, because determinant sounds just very um, like you can't get out of it. So um, overall, education, healthcare access, economic, social and community context and neighborhood. I just point those out very quickly. Again, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of that. Um, however, yeah, there you go. Uh, Colorado background um, have a lot of crossroads, basically. We have a lot of folks from Navajo and other southern areas, and then we have um, quite a bit from High Plains as well. Um, we, we do, well, I shouldn't say we have, the Southern Ute Indian Tribe and Ute Mountain Ute Indian Tribe exist without <laughs> Colorado or with Colorado. They are largely in with what is uh, called Colorado right now. So as we all know, censuses have changed. And so in 2020, we, it depends how you do the, the data. So it could go from like 194 something to 208 uh, for um, American Indian Alaska Natives alone or in combination. So the way we kind of estimated 150 were um, eligibility requirements and that a lot of people were choosing, um, you know, the very important, of course, but um, more Chicano uh, type of folks when they're agreeing that they are, in fact, you know, on the census. So we have to be careful about that. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, point out two problems or, or not problems, but just issues. We really have to align and support sovereignty. We have, but, you know, we have the two tribes within this state. However, we have this massive variability in nations, needs, cultures um, in the urban areas. I know some of you have that and some of you have a more like um, uh, homogeneous type 
uh, group. So it just sort of depends where you are. And this is just a real crossroads. Okay, go ahead. I don't want to go too long on any one thing because, you know, I'm, I'm quite the wordy one. So this is our mobile unit. Um, I'm happy to give details if anybody wants it um, a little bit later. I wanted to point out that in our state, gentrification has been pretty strong. If you see jokes about it, Colorado is almost always <laughs> the state that they use <laughs> as the example, like in the onion or whatever, you know. Um, so really, we have um, quite a quite a bit of folks that have relocated. And of course, we used to have folks in Colorado Springs as well. But, um, and I just want to point out that this is the only urban clinic, clinic statewide. Um, I think that that might be helpful. See how excited we were. That is, we still are. That was in September. I'm just going to run through some conceptual stuff now. So in order to do this, we really wanted a community-based participatory model. And I know you hear that a lot in public health research, not so much in actual care, but we're trying to do both so we can solidify um, funding for the future. We didn't want to just jump in. At the same time, as you know, there are demands for care. And a lot of places just don't have the ability to just, well, we're going to wait till next year to roll that out. So we're trying to do both. Um, and in order to do that, well, actually, first let's look at let's look at our uh, model. So let's keep going here. Um, so I know a lot of people use the medicine wheel willy nilly, and um, we're not using it willy nilly. And I know I know this is a um, a Jibwe medicine wheel picture, but it, it's the best one I found for this particular discussion. So. Um, so what I wanted to point out here is it's not just all areas of care, but it's also like, how do we incorporate uh, social, cultural, spiritual in there? So um, we aren't just following the same medical model that um, of sitting here waiting, you know, and providing Western care. So that's what the medicine wheel is really meaning to us. We have to have those community voices. Also, we really feel like structural competency as opposed to um, focusing on the um, on the upstream factors, you know, what's causing the upstream factors. We want to train our docs and the places we're going um, if need be about that and what that is and how you could do that. So um, essentially our medical model um, in our in this country overall, really, as you all know, is not designed for our population. There's a very like top down power dynamic, um, it doesn't define health and wellness the same way. So we wanted to shift those things as we go here. And the medicine wheel is the best sort of design for imagining shifting those things, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so what do I mean by structural? Some of you may know this, but I just wanted to be very careful with this. And so I'm not going to read them all, but I spelled out basically if you step back from social uh, drivers of health and go, okay, what are the systemic like structural racism and um, the design of the system that causes the oppression and marginalization in the first place. So um, the years of federal Indian policy, that kind of thing, um, because uh, those aren't listed in the five <laughs> uh, determinants, right? Okay, and then quickly, I just wanted to go through our, our conceptual framework as a physical model. I wanna point out that I did um, get this and then adapt it with structural issues because they didn't have any structural issues uh, in the um, in the framework that I got it from from this uh, these folks at the um, oh I th that's weird it changed I thought I had um, sorry I'm getting stuck here I thought I had it here and I oh yeah here we go okay so it's from University of Tennessee Health Center and they adapted it actually from the big article what predicts outcomes of CBPR so. Um, the problem was none of them had structural issues, and I really think that's important when we're designing ours. Um, the key takeaway here is that our outcomes and our, and our care and our people that we're serving have to be able to inform the model as we go. So that's why you have this feedback loop. And the other key thing to take away from there is how big the equitable partnerships are. Um, that seems to be so far what's associated with long-term success of mobile units. So in other words, when I go out there and start making relationships with people, I have to make sure they're equitable relationships. I can't just show up and say, hey, can we park our unit here? Or, you know, because that's not taking good care of everybody, if that makes sense. So 
that is the number one thing associated, which you wouldn't think that. You would think it would be something else. Okay. I want to get to the good stuff. So, um, oh, did we not have that up when I was talking about it? <laughs> so sorry. I'd already gone forward. <laughs> Okay, so let's go to uh, strategy. Did they get to see the bubbles very long? They could always look at it later uh, in the follow-up. So we had both short-term and long-term goals. Um, really, that equitable partnerships, again, is huge. Um, we want more input from all the communities. All the communities in Colorado do not agree and are not the same. So it's it's really a struggle. You know what I mean? You can't just go into uh, one thing and then... Um, Thank you. Thank you, Micah. Uh, and decide that that's what's good. And then you go to the Southwest and it's completely different. So, um, and then we wanted to uh, increase the pathway. So in other words, if you go somewhere and you're helping folks and you're giving, say, referrals, you know, we, we there's a lot of struggles with referrals here because folks either don't want to or can't afford to go to take care of the issue. Um and, and other stuff so I can't afford it or they it's it's inconvenient or they're like those people aren't going to understand me and that kind of thing so we really have to create those pathways in new areas we've never been before um because if you just hand someone as we know a piece of paper and say here here's a referral that's not gonna it's not gonna go very well okay um, the other piece that I didn't say from strategy was we really had to understand how, like, well, are we going to use qualitative data? Because, I mean, I have to go out and, like, ask elders, um, have lunches, talk to key people in the community in order to really get the voice. And, and they have so much knowledge um, that it wouldn't show up, like, in a research article or whatever. They have so much knowledge that just isn't in a vulnerability map. So um, we're doing a combination is what we're doing. Um, okay, so uh, see the vulnerability maps. It, it's highlighted, but you guys can't click on it. So what I was going to do is go ahead and copy paste some of the um, uh, things that I was able to use um, to plan this out. Because basically what we did is we took a, we took a balance, community voice, and we're still doing it now. Um, all these um, vulnerability maps for, and there's a ton of them now all of a sudden for social vulnerabilities, and then you can do the vaccine layer. Would you like me to go ahead and stick that on real quick, like in the chat, or would you like me to do it after, Tiffany? Yeah, you could stick it in the chat now, and then um, we could talk about it after too, if that's helpful for folks. And the other thing, I'm just going to do it all. I hope it works to put all of them in there. You guys will have to separate it out. The other thing that was really great was actually the state. Um, and I saw Kimberly Black Horse on here. So um, in Colorado, there's a couple things I want to point out in all those links that are going together. <laughs> there. So sorry about that. Um, the real key ones that I think are really interesting is that um, Colorado has a specific one through the Department of Public Health and Environment. You can look up schools, including colleges. The colleges really only have like MMR on, on the ones I wanted to look at. And um, what's it called? Uh, Meningococcal. So, um, but you can, you can really see a lot of where that vulnerability is. And then they have their own um, vaccine equity map uh, through the Colorado Health Institute as well. And then we do have these two data specialists, Kimberly, that's on the call is one of them. And um, they're able to sort of, I give them a rundown, this is what I really need to do. And they're able to sort of produce these things or to let me know who can, which is just amazing. Again, not relying 100% on quantitative data though, because I don't think that gets it done. Okay, um, we can skip the how to um, target the person with disparity, because I think I kind of just explained that um, by balancing the information from specific people and from large groups when we have a, an event to get people to talk to us um, uh, and, and that sort of thing and then balancing that with the data. So this was our projected timeline. I got to be honest, you know, we we have moved it quite a bit. And uh, and the reason it gets bigger there is just because we're not we're not stopping the things before. So we really wanted to start with training and including that structural training I was talking about and then make it native specific. So that's what we're doing. 
And then we're beginning with immunizations. Of course, it timed a little better when it was in the fall, but that's okay. We we'll keep going. Um, and then as you can see, it gets a little bit more complex. And then the dental um, restoration should be by summer because we do have the we have two two rooms in the unit that can be converted to full dental and and full medical. So and by full, I just mean a whole table that has the, you know, light and the stuff in the, uh, you can do restorations and you could do x-rays. Um, and then, of course, by end of summer, we were hoping to do well child and, and sports physicals in the traditional way. We hope to have a peer on board. Um, so uh, that's where we are with that. And as I said, we did have to delay. So keep, keep going. Next one. Okay, so, uh, oh, wait, go back up flexibility. So we have, as I said, we've moved the rollout a little bit, but that's just because the um, estimated setbacks were really, um, were really powerful. And, you know, for instance, that um, giant vehicle, you need three days of training across the country. So if, um, we, you know, we actually had a, a death in the, in the staff that was unexpected and you know, I'm not saying that that will happen to everybody, but when you are planning such um, a driver and handler of such a really uh, important piece, the vehicle itself, you've got you got to have backup. And so um, we don't have enough backup. We don't want our, our docs and MPs out there driving it. So um, hiring can really be a problem, as you all know. <laughs> and relationships do take a lot of time to build if you're going to do it in an equitable way. Um, as opposed to just coming in and telling everyone how it's going to be. So um, so a training of all of our staff and the providers, you know, people don't get structural competency in every uh, every med school now. So um, it's starting, but it's not everywhere. So we really want to make sure we're all trained up as well. Um, okay, outside of flexibility, go ahead. Uh, learned lessons. Um, we had a readiness model that said we were ready and then we realized we <laughs> underestimated a few things our leadership support has been so powerful with this because no matter what happens we're still doing it and you know you can really feel that in the staff everybody's for it we have a good model we have a good strategy um and then we made up the phases of a rollout um uh, I would suggest using community voice, even if you're incorporating it as you go, um, because like I said, it's really difficult to spend a year asking people what they think. Um, allow for changes. We have to be flexible. We definitely have to train more people up. And um, long-term systems change is likely to be important um, when we're talking about vaccine equity. So in other words, it, getting out and giving the vaccine is one intervention. What are the other interventions that are keeping people vulnerable in those places? Like I, I want to have two or three we can look at to, to engage in so that we're affecting long-term changes, even just a little at a time. Um, I would say um, just our state and, and all the different changes they're going through can really affect how willing someone is to say, you know, work with you on a different vaccine storage, you know, solution or work, you know, um, how, how do we make prescription um, rules and regs difference for where, how you're doing this or whatever it is. So um, uh, I'd say you have to balance between the needs you see on paper and just the vocal demand that people in the Springs have been waiting so long and, and asking so loud. And it's just, it's very difficult to, but you got to balance that as much as you can. So that obviously I've said it like 10 times that, as you know, that's our first spot that we're going to. <laughs> and then finally, make sure we approach relationships in a way that's equitable um, every single time. Yeah. I think that kind of wraps it up. Yeah. So I did my best uh, uh, citations there that I could recall using. Um, any questions? Or wait, did you want to ask questions? <laughs> or did you want me to ask? Yeah, we'll hold the questions for the open floor, but uh, thank you for that great presentation. Uh, so now we'll take the opportunity to introduce the next speaker. We have Amber Martinez from Native, Native Health, excuse me. Uh, Amber has been a registered nurse for over five years. She has worked with Native Health for the past four and is currently the RN manager at Native Health Mesa. Um, during the pandemic, she led Native Health's community outreach team, providing much needed COVID-19 testing, vaccines, and health services in the community. 
She lives in Queen Creek with her husband and rescue dog Kiki. Um, so at this point, um, if you could please put your favorite food emoji into the chat box, because I am thinking about a snack. Um, and th that way we could welcome uh, Amber to the presentation. Um, Amber, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amber from Native Health. Next slide. And um, here at Native Health in Phoenix, we're a federally qualified healthcare center um, and a Title V uh, Urban Indian Health Program. And as Shelly had stated uh, with her organization, you know, uh, deciding to get a mobile unit for us really was us following our mission statement, um, you know, providing accessible care to our community members um, inside our community and um, outside of our community um, in those uh, areas that don't have as many clinics as we do here in, in the Valley. Um, next slide. And of course, um, our Native Health mission um, uh, goes into our vision of healthy people in healthy communities. Um, so we really uh, used our mission and vision statement to drive uh, why and how we were going to use um, our mobile unit. Next slide. Um, so this is a picture of our mobile healthcare unit. Uh, we have um, unofficially named him Moby. <laughs> So this is Moby, our mobile healthcare unit. Um, this is one side of him. Uh, they, as you can see, there's a door. Um, there's an ADA uh, ramp into uh, the mobile unit. Um, and then this side has a full length uh, canopy. It's a, it's a hard top canopy. So that closes down and is actually a side of the mobile unit when it's um, in transport. And next slide. And then this is the picture of the other side of, um, of Moby, of our mobile health unit. Um, as you can see, this also has um, an entry and exit door on the side as well. Um, and this side does have a canopy. This one is a smaller canopy. It's about a third of the length of the mobile unit. And it's an automatic canopy that's like a canvas. Um, and this one, even though weather is um, usually pretty, uh, uh, mild here in Arizona. Um, this one is um, sensitive. So it's automatic sensitive to any wind or rain. So it will um, retract if it, um, if it starts raining or if it's too windy. Next slide. So our mobile healthcare unit, we went ahead and went with a manufacturer based in Wisconsin. Uh, they're called CGS Premier. Um, and we uh, opted for a 30 foot by 10 foot drop trailer. Um, we do have two exam rooms as well. Um, we also added a bathroom with an incinolate toilet um, just so that we could have it when we go on longer um, uh, travel distances like out to the Navajo Nation where it's a few hours um, or down south an hour. Um, so that was really important for us. That's something that wasn't in our original design, um, but that we had come together and decided that for those long travels that we would need it um, for our staff and our community. Um, and actually also um, came in handy too when we started to extend our services. Um, so that we can do um, urine samples and, and swabbing and all of that. So, um, and then we have a middle area in between our two exam rooms um, for lab and documentation. We have, again, two exit and entry doors. Um, that was by design. Um, as a lot of you know, um, during the public health emergency, when we were doing a lot of drive-through testing, a lot of drive-through vaccination events, um, we found that, um, you know, setting up our uh, crew in the middle and doing a long middle base um, before we had our mobile unit was best because we could have all of our supplies in one spot instead of doing it on the outskirts and then having cars drive in the middle. Um, so having two doors on both sides was really important for us um, so that we can incorporate that into our drive through events. Um, and then, of course, we have the both, both canopies. Next slide. 
Um, and here's a few pictures of the inside of the mobile unit. Um, on the upper left uh, picture, you can see that's our first exam room. It's a small exam room because we added that bathroom, which is that door that you see. Um, and so this one, we have a patient chair. Um, and this is where we do a lot of our vaccinations um, because patients just need to sit. We don't need a huge um, exam table for that. Um, and we do a lot of um, triaging, vitaling of patients before going in to see the provider in the next room. Um, on the upper right corner, you can kind of see that little middle section I was talking to you about. Um, and you can see the accordion doors. Um, we have two doors that section off those treatment rooms um, and they're double-sided. Uh, so really taking into account privacy that you may need for other services that you provide. Um, we are uh, adding in behavioral health services. Our behavioral health department is going to start using our mobile unit um, and privacy obviously is really important when you're having those counseling sessions. So really um, keeping into account privacy for our patients. Um, that middle area is kind of where we uh, can draw up vaccines, uh, where we do lab draws, where we have our point of care testing machines and, and so forth. On the bottom left, you can see on the other side of that middle section, uh, we do have a freezer and a refrigerator. And um, those all kind of go into more about our lessons learned with those in a mobile unit. Um, and then peeking into the bottom left and then on the right, you'll see a picture of our larger exam room. And that one does have a full um, treatment table and a sink inside as well. Um, as some more storage areas. Um, and then thankfully, you know, another lesson learned that I'll talk about is, um, you know, our table. So the end of this month, we're getting a new table for our mobile unit, um, one that is um, ADA compliant and lower to the ground. Because uh, we found that, you know, with the use of our mobile unit, that um, a traditional exam table is, is not what works for us in the mobile unit. Uh, next slide. And this is a picture of our restroom inside the mobile unit. So that is our incinerate toilet. So it's an incinerator. Uh, we don't have to dump any liquids or feces or anything. So it makes it very easy when you're on the road. It definitely takes a lot less time, um, care and up and upkeep. Um, so I definitely recommend um, an incinerator toilet. Um, and then our sink there in the restroom. Next slide. And this is kind of pictures more lived in. So this is realistically what our mobile uh, health unit looks like. Um, so uh, you can see our vitals uh, wall there. Um, one thing that um, I'll talk about a little more later is about um, making the mobile unit a lookalike to our clinics. So everything that one of our treatment rooms looks like in our clinic as far as signs and, um, you know, you see the pain scale there, you see our translation services, um, remove your shoes if you're a diabetic, everything that um, we have in our treatment rooms in the clinics, uh, we've made our mobile unit treatment rooms look alike as well, um, especially emergency um, items such as um, on the right hand side picture, you can see the treatment room, the larger treatment room with the sink. We have the emergency eye wash station. So everything that you consider in your clinics, you also have to transfer that into your mobile unit as well. Um, so emergency eye wash station, your, uh, you can see the race um, sign there. So below that sign is um, a fire extinguisher. So we do have two fire extinguishers um, fire alarms um, equipped throughout the mobile unit. Even though it's a small space, um, safety definitely is always number one. Go ahead, next slide. Um, so talking about funding um, for our mobile health unit, um, like Shelly had said, with um, the COVID-19 pandemic, 
We did get a lot of extra funding from the government and other sources. Um, we primarily use the American Rescue Plan Act, the ARPA funds um, for us, um, which were designed to focus on areas that were disproportionately um, impacted by COVID-19. So uh, we're talking about our uh, native, um, native uh, neighborhoods and communities um, in the area. Um, and so um, when we were originally funding um, and, and planning for our mobile health unit, of course, you can plan, plan all you want, um, but you're always going to have oversights. You're always going to have details that come up or items that you've forgotten or that you realize with use that you need. Um, so originally we were um, in making the mobile unit about $40,000 over budget. So definitely um, planning your funds is super important um, and where those funds are gonna come from. Um, definitely over a long period of time too. Um, and then planning. So um, uh, a lot of planning, it took a lot of time. Um, we started manufacturing it um, around September, a little before September. Um, so as soon as we started, um, of course, we had a plan for its arrival. Um, so in planning all of this for the mobile unit to arrive, you know, you really have to look at things like your scope of service, writing all that out. What are you planning to use the mobile unit for? So those scopes of services, um, creating manuals for the mobile units, um, the SOPs that go along with it, um, getting certifications like our CLIA waiver to extend, um, liability insurance, the license and registration, uh, where are we going to store this mobile unit, um, everything that goes into it, marketing plans, IT equipment, what type of IT are we going to use in it, um, and then, uh, you know, notifying HRSA, our funding source, our accreditation notice to AAAHC that we use. Um, all of those, um, you know, take a lot longer than expected when you're planning for all of those details. Um, so definitely using a great planner um, and spreadsheets. Um, and then uh, the arrival of our mobile unit was in January of 2022. Um, so that's when it actually arrived here in Phoenix with us. Um, and then we continued to collaborate and get it ready all the way through May. Uh, we did not do our first event with it until June 27th of 2022. So you can kind of see, you know, if um, all the planning that goes into it, even though we, it arrived in January, we didn't end up using it until that summer. Um, and so our first event was a soft launch with it um, in June. Go ahead, next slide. Um, and then our staffing, uh, we had our uh, community outreach team, which consisted of a nurse manager uh, that oversaw clinical resources um, and uh, was also a service provider administering vaccines and um, health information uh, using a community events coordinator. So more so coordinating and planning community events and being um, an agency liaison and also a liaison with our community partners. Uh, medical assistance, uh, we had anywhere from at the top of the pandemic, um, eight uh, medical assistants on our outreach team. Um, and also having a medical provider um, to expand our services. Um, out in the community. So um, at first, you know, we started with vaccinations and we've grown to full-blown um, well visits, sick visits, um, and all that fun stuff. So um, operations, so uh, definitely planning for operations with these big mobile health units. Um, it is a team approach. Um, so allowing sufficient staff to um, actually man it, setting it up, taking it down. Um, our mobile unit takes two to three staff members um, just to set it up and take it down. Um, and you can see, you know, in the previous pictures, the um, manual canopy that is a full side length of our mobile unit, it can be very heavy. Um, so having a really strong um, team um, to do that is very imperative. 
Um, also um, in operations, ours is a drop trailer. So unlike Shelley's, which is awesome, you can drive it. Ours, we have to tow to and from our events. <laughs> and um, so we do not have a truck that's, um, that we can drive ourselves. So we do rely on our towing company that we have a close relationship with um, to uh, take our mobile unit to and from its destinations. Um, and then definitely uh, think about storage um, on your mobile health unit. Um, there's definitely a lack of storage in ours. I wish that we really planned better um, for more storage um, because it takes a lot um, to do these events, especially when you increase your services to include full provider visits, health visits. Um, there's a lot of um, supplies that go into that. Um, and then also just storing our mobile health unit. So, you know, knowing where you're going to store it. We store ours um, at one of our uh, local um, local storage units. So it's indoors, it is temperature controlled, and it is secure. Um, so having it indoor with Arizona, our long summer, um, the hot sun with our um, wrap of the outside, our design, our marketing, um, that is something that's really important for us is that it's indoors away from the sun, um, that it's temperature controlled because we do keep some of our supplies in there. Um, and then as far as event promotion, uh, definitely uh, when we uh, create events, um, whether it's Native Health sponsored or if it's in collaboration with our community organizations and our state and county departments, uh, we use everything from our agency websites, our social medias. Um, it's definitely important to invest in event signage. Uh, we love the A-frames because they're nice and sturdy. We can put them along uh, streets, um, up and down the streets where we're at to um, promote what we're doing. Um, and then also promoting uh, with our outside organizations that we also partner with, um, the different tribes that we partner with um, and our county and, and state um, uh, partners as well. Next slide. Um, some of our lessons learned, some of our challenges, uh, definitely I would say is the planning and the timeline. Uh, like uh, Shelley had stated, there's always unforeseen events, death of family members, um, staff changes, um, just collaborating um, as an agency with different departments. Um, it takes a while. We all know um, that collaboration is time consuming sometimes. Um, and then always, you know, uh, there's always unforeseen items. Like for us, the title and registration took some time. Uh, notifying, you know, our, our funders like HRSA and our accredita uh, accrediting agency. Um, those, some of the, a couple of those were overlooked. Um, operations and staffing. Um, one of our challenges definitely, like I stated before, is our towing, um, how we transport our drop trailer. Um, we are um, in the works of uh, securing a big enough truck so that um, Native Health can move our own mobile units. Um, so in that, that also goes into planning of uh, creating um, PDs, position descriptions um, for a driver and securing all of those um, that we need. Um, some of the things that uh, challenges that we've come across from using an outside agency for towing is delayed pickup and drop off times, uh, the expensive towing expenses, um, and just kind of, you know, long term planning. Um, as as you know, we all know, we always have to adjust for changes. Um, like I stated, we first uh, were very basic with the use of our mobile health unit, and we've grown um, the amount of services that we uh, use. Um, and so in that, also adjusting the changes of uh, the different supplies that you need, the different um, SOPs that you need to increase in your manuals, um, the different storages, challenges that we have. Um, and then also, and I know uh, Shelley had uh, touched on this now that the public health emergency has ended, you know, our funding, 
has definitely decreased. Um, and therefore our staffing um, had to be transferred and kind of taken into account of, okay, well, this is what we can do now, now that we're out of the public health emergency and a lot of those um, COVID funding fundings are now uh, ending. Um, so transitioning those roles into our agency. Um, also regulations and safety. So going through, um, you know, we of course had down in the beginning, okay, we have our fire alarms and we have our fire extinguishers and our eyewash stations and, and ADA compliance, but um, doing all those regular emergency drills that you would do in the clinic also has to be done in your mobile health unit as well. Um, and also, like I had said, you know, making it um, a clinic look alike. So everything that is in your clinic uh, treatment room is also in your mobile health unit. Um, and then now that the PHE has ended, prioritizing events that are most impactful to our underserved community, you know, reducing those barriers to care um, out in those communities. Um, that, that we service and native health, um, you know, there's a few handful of tribes that we, tribal areas that we go into, like the Pascoyaki tribe in Guadalupe, uh, the Fauna Otham um, in San Lucy, the Wallapai in Peach Springs. So all of those, um, you know, underserved communities, we need to prioritize um, going out of the public health emergency. Next slide. Um, some of our lessons learned, um, some of our successes were collaboration, um, you know, bringing all of our departments together in our agency and really showcasing our strengths and our expertise um, in our areas. Um, it really made us all uh, work together better on such a huge project like this. Um, and then Another success was our soft launch event. So not going full force, but doing a little soft launch where not so much marketing on our first event. We were able to have some extra time to execute an event, um, how long it takes us, um, practicing uh, setting up and taking down um, so that we know for our future events. Um, funding and operations, um, we've done a really great job of pivoting um, outside of the PHE and the COVID uh, fundings ending of pivoting and seeing where we can get other grants um, to help allocate funds for our mobile unit and the services we provide in the community. Um, and, you know, being able to expand those services um, out in our communities is super important. So. Um, looking at the long-term um, funding so that, you know, for such a huge investment for our agency, uh, we really had to take the time out and, and look at pivoting our direction of short-term, you know, during the pandemic to uh, what, how are we going to ut utilize this mobile unit in the next few years, the next five years, the next 10 years. Um, next slide. And this is a picture of uh, part of my team uh, during one of our COVID-19 vaccination events. Um, so it definitely takes um, a great team, a great um, collaboration within your agency to come together and plan and create um, all that goes into a mobile health unit and also operations of it. So. You know, you have your planning side of it, and then you have your operations side um, where you learn the most is actually going out in the community, using it, seeing what works, what doesn't, and being able to pivot um, and, and being flexible um, on what your needs are and how your needs um, change. Uh, so that's all I have for you all. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll give it back to Tiffany. Great, thank you, Amber, and thank you, Shelly. Uh, amazing presentations, love the work that you and your organizations are doing. Um, so now at this time, we welcome folks to come on camera if you're able to um, for the open floor portion of the session. Um, and we welcome any questions or comments for either speakers. And yes, oh, I see Lauren. Hi, hi everyone. Um, 
My name is Lauren Rodriguez, and I am Northern Cheyenne and Chicana, and I run a, an Indigenous public health nonprofit in Montana called Calling Our Spirits Forward. And so we work with tribal communities both on and off the reservations. And in particularly, we are working on a capital campaign for an Indigenous public health mobile unit. So within that, we've been working with different uh, partners, agencies, and how do we procure that? Because um, as you all know, we're late in the game with the ARPA, right? And that was a big focus. That was a big hit in Indian country. A lot of people got, a lot of organizations received uh, mobile public health units um, due to the pandemic uh, with the rollout of, of funding for vaccines and um, you know vitals and home check-ins, right? And so now that that's out, um, one of the, the questions that I had, uh, both of you uh, kind of reinstated, you know, where you've received the funding, um, how you're able to pivot into other grant sources. And so one of the things I think for myself and others to inquire is what are those other grant sources? Are they because um, you are a um, also a federally funded organization? So a lot of urban Indian health clinics are federally funded. Um, through, um, you know, through the IHS, right? Uh, so for us as Native-led NGOs, we are not. We are not under that congressional federal funding um, title. So do you have any type of, um, I guess you could say like help resources if they know, you know, this is a need um, because a lot of, uh, you know, NGOs that do have that public health background or medical background, um, that can provide those gaps in services. How do we get, um, you know, funding from resources that may not be applicable to to the sources that you each have received? And then the other question I had was more of a um, more of a logistical question. Uh, both of you kind of really uh, laid out, you know, the land of how you created this, um, like, I really like Shelly's, I really like Shelly's of how she created more of a, an indigenous public health framework using CBPR. And that's something that a lot of us in, um, as indigenous public health um, professionals, so what we what we utilize is that. So I liked how Shelly utilized that in basically creating a scope of evidence-based practices. So that was really powerful. And I really liked Amber's where it focused more so on an uh, in-depth operational, operational, you know, overview of this is how much it costs. This is what it did. This is how each of the, this is the inside of how everything looks. This is how we, um, how we chose this and lessons learned, like with the towing operations, that's a big thing. Um, also with us, like in Montana, we can't have a, we can't have a low, um, like a low kind of shuttle or a low kind of thing. We need something that can go off roads. <laughs> we got some, you know, a lot of uh, <laughs> ruts and a lot of things that are hard to go through. So one of the things too is like, you know, how do we even work with you, uh, you both on, um, oh yeah, ours cannot go off payment. See, exactly. So that's one of the questions I have is like, what other, you know, focuses that you have, um, advice for us that, you know, we're in rural areas. We're not on, you know, on just black asphalt pavement, like we're in rural back roads areas. Um, how do we get, um, kind of a architecture of like, okay, you know, Lauren, since you are in this environment, this is what we recommend for you, you know, for, for, and then there's a lot of native, um, communities that the same as mine, you know, so that would be, can really I, helpful. Oh, go can ahead. I, can I jump in on on just that last part, or do you were you not finished? No, you you can go. I'm ahead. the yeah, worst ahead Indian. In I interrupt everybody. <laughs> You're fine. I'm You're fired. Fine. <laughs> um, one thing I want to suggest is that um, you look at some of the programs and grants around the opioid state opioid responses because. Um, when I was um, working as a liaison, what happened was we were helping a lot of people. Um, that needed to do outreach in order to do some of the MATs because, you know, it, there were just people way out in the middle of wherever. And so um, it's not really the tribal opioid grant that I would look into, but I would uh, see about that. And if you, if you have that kind of capacity, if not, that then that wouldn't make sense for you. 
Um, but that is where a lot of models were developed just because of what was happening with politics and where the opioid money was going. And then what happened in, in Colorado anyway, was that some of the folks that were doing that on, you know, two days a week, they didn't have enough people out in that one area to have um, an MAT type outreach clinic every single day, but then they could do like public health type and, and prevention and stuff um, mm -hmm. and public health nurse, you know, oh, let me look at that foot or whatever, you know, to, to help um, with that type of thing because they had the unit. So they could still mm -hmm. do that. It wasn't like mm -hmm. breaking any of the rules or anything, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing is we're applying for lots of grants, but that doesn't mean that we have them yet. So I kind of feel like saying what we've been successful at applying for would be um, premature, um, but we did really stretch our minds. Usually we don't look at, um, well, and I can't say it's approved or anything. We're, we're just in the process of reviewing it, but we did look at, um, at things that would probably be, uh, I don't know, geared toward the um, academia, which normally we wouldn't do because it's all about providing services and, you know, taking time to construct a, a, a rigor for publishable data is just, that's very challenging for, you know, normally we wouldn't want to look at that. So, but I would, I would definitely search uh, words like indigenous models or, you know, that kind of thing, because um, you might find some stuff that way, but you'd have to be really willing to get involved in some of those science C type things. Um, that's, that's kind of one of the reasons why we had such a drawn out conceptual model was to try to tap into overall health equity funds and yeah. places that are interested in that. Got you. Thank you, Shelly. Yeah, because right and now then we're the state, at the state is where we're applying for a lot of stuff. So got you so state funded grants okay because yeah cause that's what we're looking at a lot of the fundings that we're searching for is health equity health equity is this huge you know um now topic right um and so um within that health equity you know we have to look at those determinants of health and um let me see what um sheena yellow hair i'll take a look at that discretionary funds good so i'll take a look at those because again this is huge and I also want to um, also just put something in both of your, your guys' ears that, you know, um, there's not enough representation in public health as indigenous led public health leaders, you know, like myself, you know, to come in and to help. And, and a lot of that's kind of um, consulted with non-native public health, you know, officials that have always been um, that type of westernized framework of like, oh, well, they've always done it, you know, they've always done a decent job. But yet we still have these determinants of health. We still have these issues because there's nothing really helping with the inside, you know, focusing the inside out. So I do want to just do a shout out to, um, you know, with Indigenous Public Health that we are available. And um, that is important to kind of, you know, lead it um, by Native from Native, you know, within our communities. Because um, that was something I noticed missing in the gaps within both of your analysis. Um, Another thing was just, um, I, I seen that Amber had questions about, uh, I mean, it had the collaborations with working with tribes. How about with native led nonprofits or even allyship? Um, that would be important for me to understand because we do work with tribes and tribal health departments as well as other native nonprofits. And um, we work within that um, kind of like consortium cohorts and things like that. But how have, how have have you guys worked on that or is it more on a bigger level as an urban Indian, you know, health clinic kind of working with the tribes in that aspect? Yeah, actually both. Um, so for example, um, our partnership with the Pasquayaki tribe, um, you know, their tribe provides um, dental care for all of their tribal members. Um, and so we partner with them um, because uh, they're, Bigger headquarters in, is down in Tucson, which is a couple hours away, um, but their smaller um, tribal headquarters is in the town of Guadalupe, which is a very small town. Um, and so uh, we contract all of their dental work. So all of their patients that need dental, uh, we're, we take care of that for them. So we do have that partnership with the tribe. Uh, we're uh, they foot the bill for their uh, tribal members for dental services. Um, but we also um, 
support that partnership in doing a lot of vaccination efforts um, in their communities, bringing our mobile health unit to um, their elementary school, um, make, doing um, back to school drives for them. Um, awesome. So we do foster that relationship very closely. It's a very tight knit community, small community. Um, a lot of them are Spanish speaking. Um, so, and they had really high rates of COVID um, and, and unfortunately a lot of um, death rates from COVID-19. So that definitely is a, a partnership that we have. Um, but other, other tribes um, that we've gone out to, it's just um, a collaborative um, effort as far as what are your needs? Um, like um, out in San Lucy, the uh, Thana Atham uh, tribe, uh, their main thing is um, a lot of their children were missing the first two weeks of school because they didn't have their vaccines that were required for school. Um, so we have a, a looser relationship with them where we go in and we help them with their um, with their um issues that they have in their community of, of accessibility. Um, so we go in and we, um, before school, and we do um, the school drives where we do the sports physicals for them um, and the back to school physicals. And we give, you know, um, school supplies whenever they come in. So talking about incentives too, um, for people coming to your events, um, we're always uh, very generous with our incentives, whether it's school backpacks and school supplies for the kiddos to come in, uh, right. whether it's um, uh, one of the uh, grants that we use is our HIV grant. So that's one of the services that we also use the mobile health unit for. Um, so we were able to use some of those resources and fundings. Um, but uh, for those, it's um, you know free condoms, lube, um, education, um, uh, even bus passes um, for those, you know, um, for a lot of the unsheltered individuals incentives can be um, bus passes, um, sun bags we did this year during the summer with sunscreen and lip balm and lotion and the hats, socks, cool. um, you know, so um, we have a lot of different types of partnerships, some that are, are more contractual and some that uh, we just go when, when they need us and we kind of do a yearly um, thing of it. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. I just appreciate it. And I would love to meet with you both uh, privately too, just to have more questions. Um, I don't want to take any more time, but yes, this was amazing. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for the um, participation and discussion. Um, a lot of good information here. Um, and thank you to the folks that are able to stay on a little bit uh, longer. Um, we did go past a little bit, but great conversation. Um, so now I will pass the mic over to Micah and she will quickly review some of um, the upcoming events and resources that we have for folks. Yeah. Yes, thank you guys so much for uh, your participation and your great questions. As a reminder, Nakui does have the Be a Good Relative cam uh, campaign materials available for you to share for, uh, with your clinic and your any um, anybody that you like. Um, there is also the Your Covered COVID-19 Vaccine Education and Equity Project that you can access and use. Oh. We do have a few upcoming Nakui events and funding opportunities. Um, on the 19th, we have the Mental Health First Aid for Urban Indian Organizations. In February, we have our Building Bridges, Building Trust, an open forum on COVID-19 insights. And then be on the lookout for the um, announcement for the upcoming Nakui 2024 annual conference. Very exciting. And as a reminder, we are still looking for one more uh, fundee for our ECR program. So that application is still ongoing. Please feel free to look into that and apply. We would love to have you. And that is, um, that's going to be all for us. If you need anything, please feel free to reach out to either myself or to Tiffany after this. We will be sending out, um, as promised, the recording and the slides from this uh, in within the next few days. And as a reminder, please take um, our evaluation to let us know how we did. We greatly appreciate all of you and would love your feedback.
Thank you all so much for your time. We at NICUI appreciate you volunteering not only your time, but your thoughts, opinions, and suggestions. We will hang around for just a moment for any additional questions or comments, but please have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again, Shelly and Amber. Um, great presentations, um, and we love the work that you're doing. Um, yeah, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank, thank, you, thank you, so you guys. Much. Yeah. It was great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.